All right. Welcome to the Upgraded You podcast. And today we have a special guest, Andrew Scarborough. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So the interesting part of our podcast that, you know, I had guests as Dom D'Agostino and also Professor Thomas Seafried. So in several conversations, either with them or or other podcasts, I heard about your case and also in lectures from uh, Professor Seafried. So it's uh, kind of interesting to have my own questions to ask and not just hear about you as a case study. Questions in terms of implementation? Of, of your, of basically, I'm, I'm very much interested, uh, first of all, in your condition. Uh, how, how did you get there and get out from this hole, which definitely was a very difficult situation as I understand. So could you take us back from the beginning when, when it started and um, without, you know, uh, I'm sure you, you said this story so many times already, but still uh, for the, some of the listeners probably never heard about. So just uh, key, uh, key points. Yeah, sure. Thank well, you. it seems like such a long time ago now, which mm -hmm. is a good thing, I guess. And I haven't had a recurrence since then, so. Early in 2013, I suffered a, a brain hemorrhage on a busy train. And uh, after many misdiagnoses, I was diagnosed with an anaplastic gastrocytoma brain tumor and uh, also grand mal seizures. So mm -hmm. I then began to have lots of uh, quite debilitating uh, seizures before eventually having a, an, an emergency operation to remove the uh, as much as possible of the the mass that they didn't quite know what it was but eventually mm -hmm. i was given the diagnosis of an anaplastic gastrocytoma which was mm -hmm. highly vascular and not responsive to the conventional treatments mm -hmm. so does that care. mean since you say it's not really uh responsive to traditional care that and it's expensive, uh, expanding because you say that it's highly vascular, right? So that means it goes with a high rate into the other parts of the brain and probably possibly other parts of the body. So what was the the by the doctors? What did they say? What was the promise? What was the the view? Well, there was a little nodule on the scans. We couldn't properly decipher what that actually meant because these scans are notoriously ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So whenever, whenever anyone has a kind of a, an idea of what's happening in the brain, it's only really an idea mm -hmm. unless you go in there and have a look. And mm -hmm. uh, the neurosurgeon knew that he left some disease in the motor strip area of my brain because mm -hmm. if he tried to do anything, I would either be paralyzed or, or dead. So he, sure. he so, so basically they, they tried to cut out the bulk of it, right, as usual. Yeah, so so most of it was removed, um, but the the area that was in the motor strip area they couldn't do anything mm -hmm. about. So that so, was so this just area is basically we talk about the speech area, as I understand, and the, the 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 motor part. So it's mainly responsible for movements and speech. Am I right? Yeah. So it's the speech and movement area of my brain, um, mm -hmm. and as a result, I had a lot of difficulties with my speech and um, some of my movement down my, my right side and facial mm -hmm. nerves. This, this eye was almost completely shut and I couldn't really open mm -hmm. it properly. No. But is it, isn't it amazing how much, because I mean, they cut out this part from your brain. Isn't it amazing like uh, how uh, plastic is the brain that you don't seem like anybody who had any <laughs> problems? No, I, I, I had no... I, <laughs> I had no hope of it actually improving. Mm -hmm. So when it did, it was quite, quite astounding to me. Hmm. I, I, I was very. What was your age about. then? What was your age? Uh, so I was 27 at the time and I'm 35 now. <laughs> wow. So it's very young, very yeah. young. Okay. Yeah. So, so traditionally this is what happens. You go to the, to the oncologist and neurologist and they, they definitely will come up with uh, some kind of plan which will normally 
means that uh, radiation, chemotherapy, and 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 cutting out the bulk of it if it's possible. So pretty much that was what happened with you in phase one, right? Yeah, they're not really uh, inventive of coming up with new actionable solutions. So it's still the standard of care for high grade yeah. glioma. Even if your tumor is shown to not be chemosensitive, you'll get the same the same treatment in the hope that magically something will happen. So I did I did have the standard of care for a period of time before abandoning it um, before I was supposed to. Mm-hmm. I'm doing air quotes because there's no real it's not scientifically based. It's just you have this protocol which is is an idea of what might be effective but it isn't, mm-hmm. isn't actually backed by significant studies. They'll say it's significant, but this is usually based on rodent models where they use these mathematical models to see how that would translate to mm-hmm. a human case. And exactly. then, they, then they say it's, it shows a significant benefit, mm-hmm. but it's, it's not necessarily the case. So traditionally, uh, when somebody is sick, Traditionally, the, the doctor is on this position and the patient is on this position, right? And so when, when was the, the, and we don't question the doctor normally because, you know, well, they studied a lot and that's true. They studied a lot to, to, to earn that position. So when was the first time when you started to question, not the doctor, but the science behind what they do? Almost immediately, um, mm-hmm. mainly because when I was, doing my, um, when I, when I was doing my, I was doing my masters in nutritional therapy at the time before I was diagnosed and mm. I'd heard about the ketogenic diet for managing drug resistant epilepsy in children. Mm-hmm. And I knew about the potential at the time it was potential it's, they, there weren't as many studies as now, and there weren't as many people doing it, which to me now just feels straight. It's nice, but it's <laughs> kind of strange from looking if I look back but uh, to cut a long story short just from that I thought I would implement this to try and mitigate some of the damage I I didn't I I had quite a significant brain damage at that point and it wasn't for any of the anti-cancer benefits because I didn't think the I was extremely skeptical of that at the time Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I gradually went on to a very strict four to one ketogenic diet to manage the epilepsy because my epilepsy mm-hmm. was out of control. Mm-hmm. I was having grand mal seizures constantly and mm-hmm. afraid to go outside and do anything. Mm-hmm. So, um, so mainly, mainly you try to deal with the side effect, right? Because that's one of the very strong side effect in this case or many other brain tumors is basically um, epileptical seizures. So that's what you, you try to solve. Yeah, the medication wasn't doing anything for me and Mm. it was actually making me feel worse and even having suicidal thoughts. But Mm. it's interesting with the medication itself because I purposely put myself on a combination of um, anti-epileptic drugs that could complement the ketogenic diet and have anti-cancer benefits. So it's not the traditional cocktail of anti-epileptic drugs that patients are usually on. Mm. One of them was I was on Keppra, but that in itself has potential benefits if you were to go down the standard of care route, which I was on for a, a short period of time before I decided to abandon it once I learned more about my mm-hmm. tumor. But the other one was sodium valproate. Um, the brand name is Epilim, and that has shown to have anti-cancer benefits uh, for a number of cancers, not just brain tumors. Um, so I knew this, I'd, I'd studied it a lot before um, deciding to go on it. I was already on Keppra as an emergency after my brain hemorrhage mm-hmm. um, on a very high dose. So I decided to, because the medication wasn't completely stopping my seizures and they were just starting to get out of control again, I decided to go on this, add to add this other um, drug which it does have horrible side effects, which is <laughs> why most people don't go choose to go on it and why they don't usually prescribe it, but it can complement 
a ketogenic diet quite well and it acts as a, an HDAC inhibitor as well, mm. um, which the ketogenic diet does as well. So, well, that, that's what I wanted to say that uh, apparently the, the ketone bodies are HDAC inhibitors, right? So, yeah, so it's kind of like giving it a one two punch. Hmm. Okay, I wanted so... to try and um, initially it was to try and sensitize the tumor to the standard of care because I knew that mm -hmm. it wasn't going to happen, but then I just responded so badly to the treatment that I thought I even just for my quality of life, I can't continue doing sure. this, and I don't think it's going to help to do that. So I investigated other methods. Uh, I added hyperbaric oxygen therapy into the mix, as well as exogenous ketones, which I discovered um, just through my background in um, my background in sports and health and fitness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no one was actually using these medically or to manage seizures, sure. or and there, or there was no at, proof at time, or any of this. Yeah. Uh, exogenous ketones for commercial or, or at that time really. it was mainly only used by like the navy seals and such right so that was yeah. very high level athletes who could buy because it was really expensive back in the days yeah <laughs> right so so when when did you start it you, you said you started a four to one ketogenic diet so for the the, the viewers who doesn't understand the terminology that means it was four units fat and one unit protein, right? And basically there was no carb in this case, right? Well, when I started, it was four to one, meaning four parts fat, one part carbs and fat. I mean, one part carbs, carbs and, carbs and, and okay. protein. One part carbs and protein. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then, and... it, it, then it evolved into just protein and fat because mm -hmm. I couldn't tolerate many traditional sure. ketogenic foods. And... and uh... So many people, when they step on this route, first of all, they doctors don't really recommend to do anything like that, but they don't have much education or nutrition anyway, as I understand. So did you get any feedback from the doctor? So you said, I do it anyway. So it doesn't really matter what they say. That's my last chance, basically. Yeah, well, at that time, there was nowhere near the understanding of these ketogenic diets for, uh, e even with epilepsy, the, the neurologist I was seeing was extremely ignorant about mm -hmm. the benefits of ketogenic diets in children with epilepsy. Who's just saying, oh, it's too difficult to tolerate and it probably won't work for you because you're an adult and you, you don't have this drug resistant epilepsy. But the more I read about it and, uh, the more, the more I understood how it works, the more I thought, well, why wouldn't this work for me? Mm -hmm. at, that, at that point, they, 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 there weren't the studies that there are now where we can point to its effects on traumatic brain injury, but I kind of put two and two together by mm -hmm. how it works and it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And and when did you start to feel some type of effect? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the first effect you were looking for is the... Apple, the, the the seizure anti-seizure part right so how how fast this effect kicked in well initially my seizures got a lot worse hmm. and i thought well <laughs> this is all i have how can i how can i cope with this because i can't give up so i um this is actually going to sound really horrible but i because I was on so much medication and I was so depressed at this point, I overdosed on my anti-epileptic drugs on purpose. They're mm. making me have suicidal thoughts. Mm. And then I woke up in hospital <laughs> after hours. Um, just I'd, I suddenly I thought I'd drift off to a nice sleep and then I woke up in the hospital. Mm. Um, and I, I was just sleepy for a long time. But then I actually had a, a resolve where I thought, well, I'm going to try and work this out and find out what went wrong and troubleshoot and start keeping a diary of all of my symptoms and just how I'm feeling my thoughts, my sleep, everything that I'm eating and what might be triggers. Mm -hmm. Cause I had a lot of triggers. I had a type of epilepsy, which I still have, but my tolerance is much better called uh, reflex epilepsy. So it has a, it's a stimulus response and it, it's more, um, it's less, spontaneous than other types of epilepsy 
it's only spontaneous if you don't know the causes. So mm. I guess you could say no, no type of ep epilepsy is really spontaneous, but that's the definition. Mm -hmm. So I gradually worked out what all of my um, sensitivities were. And then I gradually took each one that was causing me harm out or, or modulated certain things like my sleep and stress levels. My breathing was a huge thing mm -hmm. and ventilation. So um, was it uh, the stress related or was it because it's uh, the brain damage affected somehow your uh, uh, medulla, which is basically uh, uh, guiding and guarding the, the, the breathing signals? So what do you think? Well, I'm not sure of the, com the exact um, mechanism behind that, but mm. uh, we all have a seizure threshold, right? Even if we don't have traditional epilepsy. Sure. So if, if you have damage to the brain, it's kind of like you've got, it's say if you're uh, an electrician, you've got wires exposed. If you just kind of poke mm. at the wires, you're going to get electrocuted. But if you put something around it, it helps to protect it. So Sure. In my case, um, just focusing on my breathing was allowing me to calm everything down. And the, the other thing that I worked out when I was still trying to wean off all of my medication, which took just over two years to do, is extremely frustrating at times because I would develop these breakthrough seizures and I'd think, well, how can I manage this? Uh, so I added magnesium to the mix when I was doing a lot of research on how magnesium um, can help against uh, preeclampsia. So these women who get uh, seizures in, in birth. And I found they, was, they were using magnesium sulfate and that was incredibly effective. So I thought, oh. But did you megadose it? So it was, I'm, I'm sure it was a lot higher dose than normally recommended, right? Well, what I did is I actually got this magnesium chloride as a spray mm -hmm. and I added it to, I just added it to water and I started drinking that mm -hmm. and I found profound benefits really quickly with that. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. So mm -hmm. I was able to then reduce my medication further without these withdrawal seizures. That was just mm -hmm. the bane of my existence. <laughs> it's just it was causing me immense frustration at the time because I was thinking, I was told by my neurologist, this was irresponsible and incredibly dangerous to do, which it is, <laughs> but. Like, more... like you had anything to lose, right? Exactly. I was just in the depths of despair at that point. Um, so you started um... to see, you said that when you made the change first, everything got worse and then it started to get better. Did I hear that right? It got better as I moved more to a more, uh, an elimination style diet. And mm -hmm. then gradually I found that my foods that were causing me problems were all plant foods, mm. <laughs> particularly foods high in salicylates. So mm -hmm. even things like coconut oil mm -hmm. and avocados and <laughs> broccoli, which were traditional foods that people have on a ketogenic diet. So Or they, they eat especially broccoli against cancer, right? Which is, you know, we know that sulforaphane is the poster boy for anti-cancer movements, right? Yeah. But then Fair I was enough. to learn that that same pathway that you um, get the benefits of the sulforaphane from, you can activate that from being on a ketogenic diet. So mm -hmm. that those endogenous antioxidants you can produce yeah. without having to... Um, Create, without having to have that enzyme that you get from breaking down the the sulforaphane, yeah. Yeah, so basically sulforaphane would activate the NRF2 pathway, right? Yeah, and, which is also and, activated with the therapeutic ketogenic diet and sleep yeah. as well. Yeah, but also I, I just had a, a very interesting, I'm sorry to say that, but I found that uh, you said breathing and I'm, I'm uh, a practitioner of Buteyko breathing for mm, years yeah. and I'm teaching Buteyko and I just got one research which is talking about intermittent hypoxic training is activating an RF2 pathway. It's very mm. interesting. So apparently we don't have to take a lot of uh, sulforaphane or uh, 
uh, other uh, compounds. Apparently, we can do it with, as you said, sleeping and probably like heat, right? And yeah. uh, training and, and ketogenic diet. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. And that's more like environmental stress versus uh, molecular stress, right? So you started to, to feel better, right? And, and you start to eliminate. And as you said, as a summary, that you figure that most of the things what caused you as triggers were mainly plant foods. So at the end, you end up pretty much with what? Because that's the main question, right? For yeah. doctors, like, okay, so what do you eat now? Well, at that time, it was a carnivorous ketogenic diet, which... Oh, wait a second. But, but are you saying red meat that causes cancer and high cholesterol <laughs> causing uh, heart disease? So are you kidding with me? Yeah, all that stuff. I know. Um, but at the time, no one was doing this. So I didn't know anything mm. about it. I just fell into it. And I wanted to make sure I was having all the micronutrients I needed. So because I had a background as a nutritional therapist, this was way away from the kind of diet I was on before I had cancer, which is a lot of plants and not too much red meat and <laughs> mm -hmm. some fish here and there. Um, but kind of like a rainbow diet, the kind of diet they tell you to go on yeah. to prevent cancer and is, is still very, very colorful, popular right? at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the diet I was on before I had cancer. And this diet was massively different to that, but mm. I found it made me feel much better and it stopped me having seizures. Mm. The other thing I meant, I, I, the other thing I, uh, found out was that if I had fasted for three to four hours, like just having four hours plus between meals, um, immensely boosted my seizure threshold as well. Mm. So if you start to stretch the, the, the time between uh, feeding, right? Yeah. Then uh, somehow uh, the triggers didn't trigger you that much, right? That would be the... No, yeah. And, and the other thing is every morning, I still do this now, go for a, a two-hour walk mm -hmm. and that boosts my uh, blood ketones in the morning because mm -hmm. I was measuring even back then mm -hmm. just my blood ketones and blood glucose and I, I managed to establish a therapeutic zone that would give me ultimate control of my epilepsy without drugs mm -hmm. and so that, that I, means that you had a fairly high ketone level like probably in that the three four five ish yeah that's that's actually yeah that's the exact therapeutic zone for me it's mm, typically okay. between three and five and then it, and then most probably your your glucose went down to like four ish right something yeah. like that oh yeah. that's that's amazing okay and that, that that was just natural for me i think everyone has their own individual levels mm -hmm. that they can mm -hmm. achieve not like it's <laughs> not like it's um but that level would be beneficial for everyone yeah. but now, now but, you said something very interesting. I'm sorry. You uh, let's go back to the meat part because today meat is definitely uh, a common enemy. So whenever we are reading uh, some mechanistic research ideas or or uh, some some big cohort studies, uh, they always talk about how red meat is causing, and they try to figure out how it's causing uh, cancer. And it always comes up mTOR and IGF one. Now. You, you had cancer or you manage cancer, let's put it this way, and, and you ate food that on paper elevating mTOR and IGF-1. So you are a nutritionist. So yeah. you don't see that. I'm sure you see the conflict here, right? A little bit. Yeah, but then I was thinking about it and I thought, well, you're going to stimulate those growth factors more if you're eating more frequently or if you're having more glucose. Yes. So you stimulate mTOR more by doing that rather than going on this carnivorous ketogenic diet where you are still restricting protein as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not a high protein diet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically you started to do carnivore diet before it became a trend. Yeah, I was Can we say that? amazed that other people were doing it when I found out. I was doing this in, I guess I started in the middle of 2014 mm -hmm. when I, I transitioned from a, a four to one ketogenic diet to a, yeah. a four to one 
carnivorous ketogenic diet. Yeah. Which just, I thought, I thought at the time, at the time it actually didn't make sense to me that I couldn't, I, I didn't know anyone else doing that because sure. even for epilepsy, because it just made sense to me. I, I knew from my studies in nutrition that carbohydrates were not essential and I'm spending all this time counting carbs mm -hmm. thinking, Oh, I have to keep under this number. Mm -hmm. And it was just annoying me because I was weighing all my foods constantly. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it be better if you had this macronutrient that you didn't even have to count, you know? Yeah. That oh, by the way, so that's, that's, a good, that's a great, great, uh, uh, thing. What you mentioned that, uh, so did you count your calories after you to switch to like this carnivorous diet? So, or did you have to, so did you try to keep, uh, a maintenance level or a little bit below or you were like well actually my hunger is definitely showing if if i have to eat or not because i'm not eating any more real carbs well yeah i was keeping a maintenance level so i lost a mm -hmm. ton of weight mm -hmm. <laughs> which wasn't good um it got to the point where i did have this incredible mental clarity and i felt kind of high at times like buzzing and full of energy but i could I, at one point i could barely lift my legs to get anywhere <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, i had all mm -hmm. this energy but i couldn't actually propel myself up a, a flight of stairs sure. or, you know it's kind of uh yeah i got i got to an extreme level at mm -hmm. that point but i felt i just had this incredible clarity from it it's got and i got into fasting quite a bit mm -hmm. but yeah I, i've always been quite lean and i lose fat very easily mm -hmm. um so I have to be careful not to lose muscle as well. <laughs> so, so, so can we say that if you follow the, the nothing but the traditional uh, care, probably we would not talk to each other right now. Would that be a fair statement? Theoretically, yeah. All we can of do course, is speculate. It's just a theory. But what we did see is after, my, after I abandoned my treatment, there was still this signaling activity on scans. Mm -hmm. I had a type of scan called uh, MR spectroscopy. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to see the bioenergetics of whatever's mm -hmm. in that area. And you can actually identify and, and distinguish between different types of brain tumor and, and brain injury from that mm -hmm. without having to do a biopsy, but it's not, it's not completely, um, it's not completely accurate. So there's some degree of unknown, but it did show these uh, substrates that were consistent with still having um, an anaplastic astrocytoma brain tumor there. Mm -hmm. So we were keeping an eye on that and gradually over about a year, it started to disappear mm -hmm. um, to the point where it's no longer visible. Mm -hmm. That did take a while, but it did, it seemed to have that final push after I had the hyperbaric oxygen therapy and was combining that with exogenous ketones and the magnesium and also uh, frankincense essential oil that I was mm. taking under the tongue. Mm -hmm. Frankincense was a hugely important thing for me because I was able to find this very pure um, oil that you could just take under the tongue and it had this immediate effect where I could feel it getting to the brain. Mm -hmm. And I had it at times as my emergency medication. So often I would take this when I'd experience an aura, which is a warning that a seizure is going to come. Mm -hmm. I would take it and then it would quite surprisingly rapidly reverse my symptoms of that, that seizure-like activity. And again, it's not, traditionally not recommended. So again, it's a very interesting uh, thing you mentioned this. No, so I, found, I found it by accident as well. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember how I found it out, but um, just I was looking for something that would optimize my omega-3 and 6 ratio. Mm -hmm. And I found that the, the boswellic acids, which are in the frankincense essential oil, um, can actually, uh, it acts on a pathway that's on the arachidonic acid pathway, it kind of inhibits that so that um, it has antithrombotic effects and it has 
effects on these, um, just these pathways involved with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And in this case, neuroinflammation. Mm, so yes. it was not only optimizing my omega-3 and 6 ratio, but it was also uh, quelling any neuroinflammation that was there when I was about mm. to experience these mm. uh, seizure activities. So about how long did it take to start to see uh, major changes and you started to see like, yeah, probably I can make it? Well, th that was almost immediate, just whenever I saw my oncologist he was just so happy that i was doing so mm -hmm. well because that wasn't expected um yes and and by the way just for those who are watching this we, in no way we are saying that you should not go to the doctor not work with your doctors that's not the point because you always get the feedback from the doctor that you are actually in the right path right well he he did think what i was doing was very interesting but uh the interesting thing from that is that uh, I went on a, in 2014, the end of 2014, I went on a conference with the charity Matthew's Friends, which is an organization that helps children with drug resistant epilepsy to go on ketogenic diets. Mm -hmm. I found they were having a conference in Liverpool and uh, I went to that conference. Um, I had just read uh, or the, the year before, actually, I'd read uh, Thomas Seyfried's book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, mm -hmm. and I'd contacted him uh, very, very soon after my diagnosis, actually, because I thought this is interesting, but I, <laughs> I didn't have any faith in it. I, mm -hmm. I, even after talking to him, I thought, well, this sounds too good to be true, so I'm just sure. going to hold back on that um, and just do it for trying to manage the epilepsy. That's all I, that's all I cared about at that point. But to go back to the conference, yeah, I went, I went to this conference in 2014, met Professor Seyfried in person, also Dom D'Agostino and Adrian Sheck and all these people um, that were talking about the ketogenic diet for epilepsy because it was an epilepsy conference. Mm -hmm. And this was at a time where you don't have these kind of keto celebrities that you have now. <laughs> so, uh, Everything was very new and interesting. And they were talking about the ketogenic diet for brain tumor related epilepsy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which just gave me more, it gave my, the, the foundation of what I was doing more, more, more strength. It gave it more uh, relevance. So that I could say to the, to my oncologist that this is worth uh, all my efforts. And then from that conference, I found that Charing Cross Hospital in London was um, very welcoming to this uh, implementing metabolic therapies, mainly the ketogenic diet for brain tumors. And so I, tran I, tr I transitioned to have all of my care at uh, Charing Cross and at, the, at that time, they were thinking of having clinical trials with the ketogenic diet, and they're still working on that because they're trying to optimize it mm. many years later, unfortunately, but wow. um, it's getting there. And I, I was supposed to be uh, helping them to coordinate those clinical trials because after a few years, I became a, a scientist myself. So that's what I wanted to ask. Cancer. Sorry for interrupting, but you know, in most of the super... Uh, human movies starting that, you know, somebody's getting uh, bitten by something. So there is a major problem. And out of it, uh, the main character comes out as a hero. So now, of course, you are the hero here. <laughs> so, so basically, you got so much inspired through your own um, illness and the whole process that now you're helping others. That's what you are saying, basically. Yeah, and then I came Very across amazing. then I came across other people who were doing incredible things. I came across Pablo Kelly, who yeah, I heard about him. He uh, well, he heard about me and decided to adopt a ketogenic diet through my story. Isn't he ha uh, have um, a glioblastoma multiforme? So he has a different yeah. form of very aggressive yeah. uh, brain tumor. And normally these people, I mean, like Senator Mc McCain, right? So he died probably six months after he got diagnosed. And that's pretty much it is. Yeah, it's pretty common. 
Yeah, and and he's in his what fifth year probably. Yeah, so he's uh, well, he's I guess he's maybe six now because wow, I'm coming up to my eighth year, and he was just a couple of years um, after me. So <laughs> after and he's segment. he's active, right? So he's living fairly normal life, right? Oh yeah, he's getting better all the time. So. Amazing. He uh, his his tumor was initially inoperable as well, so the diet and it, the diet gradually made it operable that's what um my oncologist who now who i see now is also a neurosurgeon mm. and he tells me that when patients fast for a few days before um when i when they fast for a few days and go into this therapeutic ketosis before the the operations the tumor is easier to remove because the margins are more clearly defined. It becomes mm. like an anti-angiogenic treatment. The, just uh, fasting. It, it, it's happening because already there was some amount of apoptosis probably. And well, it's the, it's, it's, um, it's having an anti-angiogenic effect. So that uh-huh, okay. the, those, those blood vessels that are being constantly generated to supply the tumor with nutrients, they're, mm essentially being starved. So mm. the, the tumor is much less vascular, so it's easier to remove. Mm, I understand. I understand. Yeah. So basically now you live full life. Are you still on the, on the diet? Oh yeah. If, if, even if I slip up on the diet, I instantly have seizures. So that's good motivation to, to keep going. Yes. But I am able to tolerate a lot more foods now. Mm. So yes. while I, while I still need to, maintain therapeutic ketosis Mm -hmm. i'm able to do so implementing more foods that i couldn't get anywhere Mm and couldn't go anywhere near before so that's really interesting just that not only have i had that signaling activity disappear on my scans but the scar tissue has actually shown improvements over a longer period of time because it takes a long time to do that if it ever happens but just yeah i've managed to get better all the time, which Mm -hmm. feels really good. But then at the same time, you have this kind of survivor's guilt because I've had so many friends and loved ones uh, Mm -hmm. pass away of mostly brain tumors. So Mm -hmm. it's a sobering reminder just of... in, In the other hand, you said you are able to help others. Do you see, and possibly using the very same method, do you see also remarkable changes on other people when they follow strictly this diet? If they can comply to it, yes. That's the main issue. Mm-hmm. Food is a very emotive thing. <laughs> and some people just, even if they have all of the information and even if you spell it out for them and tell them every little um, thing that you can about it, just they'll either half try it and then just stop Mm -hmm. or they just won't comply at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the main issue that we have, which is Mm. for me, it's incredibly frustrating. (laughs) So basically it's compliance, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think because I have a, uh, because I have a background in, in a, a, a health and fitness background, I, even before my diagnosis, I was used to going on very strict, very restrictive diets <laughs> and also just pushing myself to the limit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of um, endurance events and also mm-hmm. um, lots of uh, just lots of other activities, just very active and mm-hmm. constantly running around. Sure. Uh, I played badminton at quite a high level for Berkshire. Um, and yeah, just very competitive and pushing myself. And I had a few interesting body transformations as well over the mm-hmm. years where I just didn't, didn't look anything like myself at times, uh, just but, did some crazy things just out of interest and experimentation. So you mentioned that, uh, I just stepped back a little bit. You said when, uh, you ate, um, some type of plant foods, um, the problem flared up. So now you are a nutritionist, you're a scientist. So 
when you're connecting the dots, can you say that probably you had a leaky gut syndrome and and you could not say that? No, because I had no problems. Um, well, I don't. I think it was more leaky brain. Oh, okay, it was leaky gut because uh -huh. I had I had no issues with digestion or anything like that. Yeah, everything but, just fine. <laughs> uh huh. No, I'm I'm asking because just because somebody doesn't have the symptoms, probably yeah. it could be still there. The the well, I did have tests for that at the time as well, uh -huh. and just okay. it was fine. There's no. Oh, issue. okay, I understand. <laughs> I mean, but but you clearly made the connections between certain foods and, and as acting as triggers, right? Yeah, it was bizarre because over the years I've had so many different tests. Just every six months, I was having a battery of blood tests and mm -hmm. and saliva and urine and just everything, hair, um, <laughs> to try and assess, you know, where I was deficient or what was going on and trying to connect the dots. But everything everything seemed fine. So I was thinking, well, why am I having these reactions? Mm -hmm. And then I just thought, well, I just need to keep keeping these diaries and try and just work it out through... Mm -hmm biofeedback and listening to my body tests mm -hmm. don't always tell you everything <laughs> yeah now it was very surprising what you said that mainly some of those uh trigger foods were like uh, like coconut or coconut yeah. oil what you said which is normally seen as very safe for in most of the times right but apparently you were like very sensitive for for certain elements of it certain uh, chemicals so so today had you eat also and still carnivore you said you are making about two hours walk every morning yeah which it's my is routine it, is it is it form uh, because you were talking about breathing uh is it f uh, more for relaxation uh or what what is the main purpose be, be, besides of course it's a nice walk exercise yeah so there's a few benefits to it. I get my AM sun, which mm -hmm. uh, is kind of difficult to get now, but sure. it's, it's dark when I go out now. But usually I get my AM sun, so that's good for regulating my circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. And that helps tremendously with uh, also regulating my seizure threshold and keeping it high because there's this... People who experience any kind of epilepsy, often there's a, a rhythmicity to it in terms of the, your circadian biology. You'd be more mm. prone to having seizures at certain times of the day. And if you're bombarded with artificial light, you throw that off even more and you can be prone to having seizures at all times of the day. And just, mm. you have that hyper excitability in that area of the brain where the seizure is happening, or if it's the, the whole brain, then that's, that's even worse. Mm -hmm. So the main benefit for me, I would say, is regulating my circadian rhythms. The other benefit I find is the breathing. I focus on my breathing when I'm walking. Um, and the other one I find is after about 30 minutes, I get this kind of buzz. And after my walk, I find that my blood ketones and my blood glucose are more in that range or in my therapeutic zone. So often when I'll go out, um, I'll not feel so great. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but then the walk helps me to, to slip into that, to that zone. Mm -hmm. I found when I have t had times where I haven't had that walk, my seizure threshold isn't as high mm -hmm. and my blood glucose raises a bit. I guess that's the, the dawn phenomenon that mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. referred to, but I can overcome that by going on my long walks. And mm -hmm. that seems to have the benefit after about uh, 15 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. having a fasted walk. So you said you are a, um, also a nutritionist and, and an ex-athlete. Also, uh, you have a, a trainer certification, as I understand. Yeah. Do, you, do you work with, uh, with athletes? Not anymore. Uh -huh. um, but I was... I wasn't really training athletes. It was more, um, <laughs> it was at this uh, place called the Lensbury in Teddington, uh, in just, just outside London. Well, it's kind of on the outskirts. Um, so it's this kind of private club where you did have a lot of athletes and a lot of rugby players. 
Um, but I was mainly training people with uh, a lot of privileges, let's say, <laughs> mm -hmm. who, who did who did demand a good, you know, service. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I was doing one to one personal training classes um, and doing a lot of swimming as well. So I'd occasionally do some lifeguarding and mm -hmm. other things. Now, regarding to nutrition, um, so you following the, let's say the carnivore diet or some, uh, some form of it. Variation, yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so basically, let's say somebody is a high-level athlete and thinking about switching to that, would you recommend some variation of the carnivore diet to this person? And if so, what kind of modification you see for different athletes? Well, I'd make, recommend that they try it at least mm -hmm. and try it for a good period of time because there is this adaptation period, mm -hmm. which I found absolutely, well, it was actually the adaptation from normal a standard diet to ketogenic I found hard, but the, the transition from ketogenic to a carnivorous ketogenic diet was actually very easy because I had this rapid benefit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know for, I think for endurance athletes, it's, I would definitely recommend it, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not sure about bodybuilding or, uh, or for power athletes. Yeah. And, and, uh, for the transition, what you mentioned, would you recommend possibly using for the transition, uh, exogenous uh, ketones to ease the process? Yeah, I would it just in the transition phase um mm -hmm. or also if you're if you're doing um again endurance activity um i find i well i use it for i use it for exercise to increase my seizure threshold but i'm sure that also has benefits when you're um just running out of gas so to speak oh, okay um, so uh -huh. okay so it's kind of gives you a top up but um, I do know they've been used in the in the Tour de France exogenous ketones, mm -hmm. and they've tried mm -hmm. to question: Is this should this be allowed? Is this a performance enhancing drug? Mm -hmm. But because it's a natural thing, I, I guess they can't really do anything about it. It's like creatine in the nineties. Yes, they're thinking: Should we ban this? It's you know, is it yes. natural? But yeah, you know, it's like eating so, tw twenty steaks. <laughs> so. Today you are symptom free, uh, and, and if I stay in my therapeutic zone and I get enough sleep and mm -hmm. all these things, then I don't have any symptoms. So basically, what you were talking and you're saying clearly is basically you were talking about the circadian rhythm, right? Yeah. Some fairly easy exercise. What you mentioned, I know it's two hours, but still it's, it's a low threshold exercise. I, basically. Yeah. I, I make sure to do a lot of low level activity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's hugely beneficial. So being active, basically, that's what you say. Just uh, like, like now I'm standing, I'm not sat mm -hmm, down. Sure. And I, I, I spend as little amount of time sitting as I can just because I value that low level activity. I find that that keeps me in my mm -hmm therapeutic zone and it keeps me sharp as well mm -hmm, i'm much mm -hmm. more productive when i'm standing than and walking around than when i'm sure sat down so i, I average at least twenty thousand steps a day and on my maximum days i'm about sixty thousand steps mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then i also have like a, an exercise bike over there so oh, okay okay so if you i'm watching yourself... a movie or something yeah <laughs> and then and then you were talking about uh possibly using some ketones, but just, just additional things. Yeah. The, um, the other benefit I have to using exogenous ketones is it helps me to spare lean tissue. So because I'm sure. so, because I'm so active, mm -hmm. if, if I do that, it helps me to helps me to maintain that, which I, I struggle with sometimes I've I, over the past couple of, well, it's three years now. It took me three years to, put on 10 kilos because i lost a, so much weight sure but but that's also probably very valuable information for those who think like if anything ever happens it would be nice to have a fairly high muscle mass i mean i'm not talking about bodybuilder high muscle mass but 
but a muscle mass that can serve me in case there is yeah. some problem, right? I think the only consideration is the electrolytes because with exogenous ketones, they're bound to a, like a salt formulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So especially, so especially for me with my epilepsy, I need to be mindful of my electrolyte balance. Mm -hmm. so, so like we talk about sodium, magnesium, uh, potassium mainly. Yeah. Sodium, mm -hmm. mag yeah. So when I, uh, if, if I choose to fast, sometimes I do because it's, um, convenient and I have this phenomena where even if I'm eating a, a ketogenic meal, um, that can actually trigger a, a very low level seizure activity, even though it's ketogenic. Mm -hmm. So if I want to fast, even for a prolonged period of time, um, I have this, um, I actually have it in here now. Just, <laughs> it's just water with, um, it's water with sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, uh, sodium bicarb, and potassium, potassium mm -hmm. chloride. So you take sodium bicarb, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. It's, it's a, kind of a very old medicine, right? And it's not sexy anymore. <laughs> but we know that, for example, when sodium bicarbonate goes to the stomach, it also creates some amount of CO2, right? which is pretty cool if you think about it. It's almost like you're breathing in CO2 from a brown bag, Yeah, <laughs> which is also anti-seizure. Yeah, exactly. Right? So smart. And uh, I found that out the, the hard way when I was trying to fast in the early days, just that I had what's called breakthrough seizures. Mm -hmm. So a breakthrough seizure is when you just have a seizure out the blue and it's just completely out of sync with regularity, with, with what's normal. And I found that it was due to the fact that I was depleted of electrolytes when I was fasting. Mm -hmm. So I did an experiment where I went on a, I went on a, well, it was initially supposed to be a 12 day fast and I made it to nine days mm -hmm. and then I had a breakthrough seizure and I thought, well, what was different about today? Cause, cause I was having these uh, kind of electrolyte drinks that I was making myself. And the only difference was that I hadn't added any salts to my water. <laughs> and, and then as soon as I did, it just brought my seizure threshold back up and I felt a lot more awake because mm. after you have a seizure, you can feel really dopey and sleepy and just have this brain fog, but mm -hmm. it brought me back up to those levels. And yeah, <laughs> so it's pretty cool because then I was able to experiment with even longer fasts. So mm. my longest one is 14 days. Mm. And after a few days, it was quite hard. But then after a while, you get kind of addicted to it. And <laughs> it felt great. So. Yeah, because the, the focus is amazing, right? Yeah, but you can, you can get addicted to it. I have a, an addictive personality, so... Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it, especially who had uh, previously, who knows, had issues like bulimia, right? Yeah. You know, that probably for them offering anything which is very on the side, on the extreme part of, of eating, it's not the best idea because they get addicted. Yeah, well, before my diagnosis, I actually had, uh, I actually had um, problems with binge eating and um, bulimia as well, so. Mm. Um, <laughs> but just on a ketogenic diet, I haven't had any of those issues. Right. Managed to control it. So this has changed my brain chemistry so that I don't have mm -hmm. the only issue that I had at one point was when I added, uh, sweeteners to it. Cause then that just, I found, I just had problems with that huge mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. So I just have to avoid those completely. Sure. So what I'm trying to do with this podcast, uh, this part I'm recording with you is going to be also translated and subtitled to Hungarian. Okay. And, and the, the reason is simple. I got several uh, uh, emails about some type of uh, brain tumors with certain people that they were interested to hear and read more about some solutions. 
and but they couldn't find much information on in, in Hungarian. So I was thinking about this could be a very interesting uh, way to help them. Possibly that you know an interview with somebody who's been there, who is who is there still, who became a scientist, and uh, and dealing with these kind of issues and and helping to solve this puzzle. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Well, I wish more people were doing this. It's more people are, but not as many as I'd hoped at mm-hmm. this stage. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, I really appreciate the, the time you spent with us. Uh, it's a very valuable material. And I really hope that, especially after we translate, it will reach a lot of people. And for me, it was an honor to talk to you because, again, I always heard about you as a case study. So now it's, it's great to see you alive and, and, uh, and happy and kicking. So that's always good. And I, I really appreciate that, all the experiences you shared with us, because I, I'm very sure that you are helping to a lot of people. I hope so. The other thing as well, I guess, as a, a departing note, is that we're in the time of COVID at the moment, and that can be stressful for a lot of people, but never end- underestimate the power of uh, even just, as I was mentioning earlier, walking and um, these these therapies in general, these metabolic therapies on on the on mental the mental side and general well being in that in that mm-hmm. respect, mm-hmm. just adds, it's hugely powerful. Yes, I agree. Thank thank you for this uh, last note. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay. Again, thank you very much, and I I really appreciate your time, and just I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. you, Andrew. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day.